Oh, there we are. We should be live in one minute. Are there any attendees, Allison, that are not panelists? Uh, nope, and uh, we are live. Okay, so we're good to go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Town of Manlius Comprehensive Planning Stormwater Study Group Day Number One. Um, we are honored today to have some guest speakers representing um, Onondaga County services and, in, and information. Um, we do hope that our next meeting will have people maybe representing the state or um, broader uh, resources like FEMA. Um, but in, for this one, we're gonna stay a little bit local and um, with information that is closer to home and perhaps more relevant to residents who may be um, worried about stormwater or aware of flooding risk or wanting to do their environmental part to um, control um, dangerous stormwater runoff. So those are all sort of things that we're hoping to cover today. My name is Sarah Wall Bollinger. I am Deputy Supervisor of the Town of Manlius. I'd like to turn it over to Heather Waters and then we'll go around our, our squares and introduce everybody. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hi, I'm Councillor Heather Waters, and I'm delighted to be here with you all. I also want to thank the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee members that have joined us, and our colleague at the town, Rob Cushing, and of course, our other councillor, our brand new councillor, sorry, William. William. <laughs> sorry, William. Thank you for being here. Um, I think that what, what folks should know if they're just tuning in is that the comprehensive plan process for the town of Manlius um, is in the stage where we are still garnering a lot of feedback and we're doing a lot of investigation and, and we're having a lot of dialogue and uh, we are looking to highlight all the very important issues that must be included in the comprehensive plan, which is a comprehensive land use plan at its core, um, but, but for issues like sustainability um, and a climate action plan, we understand that, uh, that they should, those issues and conversations about quality of life to interconnect with it and not be siloed um, from it. So when we talk about storm water, um, we know that it's very much a quality of life issue. We know that it's very much a sustainability issue. We know that it has everything to do with zoning and economic development too. So um, we found this process to be one that is completely interdependent. And we also want to make this as accessible as possible. So that's why we recorded the session and we encourage you, if you're tuning in, to please email us at comprehensive planning at townofmanlius.org or call the, the town and we'd be delighted to answer questions, put you in touch with folks and get you involved. I'll turn it back over to Sarah to can introduce our panel and thank you so much. We have two guest speakers this evening. I, and then, we'll, so we'll come back to them to actually do their public speaking. But I wanted to introduce um, Lauren Darcy, who's with the Stormwater Coalition with the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. And Aaron Bucha, who is with the Soil and Water Conservation, whatever, what is it, Aaron? Soil and Water Conservation yes, Council? Sir. Okay, <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, so welcome to you guys. And now let's see, uh, William, you want to go next on your self-introductions and we'll go from there. Sure. Thank you, William Nicholson. Again, as Heather mentioned, I'm the newest appointed or newest elected town councilor here in the town of Manlius. And I want to thank everybody, particularly our experts tonight, for joining us. This is an incredibly important issue to all of our constituents, residents, and businesses um, for all the reasons previously mentioned. So I just want to express my gratitude and let's get right into it. Um, Mayor Worrell? Paul Worrell, Mayor for the Village of Manlius. And he's a member of the steering committee for the Comprehensive Plan. Um, Rob? Yep, Rob Cushing, Town of Manlius Highway Superintendent. Uh, been around uh, a few years, so seen some flooding and been involved with uh, a lot of different uh, aspects of the uh, stormwater. So hopefully I'm here to uh, give some advice and do what we can to help out. Uh, Gary? Yes, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Gary Nichols. I live on Enders on um, Sugarland Drive off of Enders Road, um, and I'm a residential homeowner. Um, I have a drainage that runs past my property called Crane Brook, which sometimes goes over its banks, and that's that's my situation. Andy, welcome. Hi there. I'm Andy Brewer. Um, I'm a town of Manlius resident. I live on the uh, Lakeview Drive, um, budding uh, Snooks Pond here off of Woodchuck Hill. Uh, my nine to five world is Huber Brewer Construction Company. I do not profess to be a civil engineer, but I'll try to add value where I can. Thank you. Mary. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Mary O'Reilly and I'm actually um, adjunct professor at the School of Public Health at University of Albany. But I worked uh, for 10 years uh, for the New York State Department of Transportation as an environmental specialist. And I did a lot of work with stormwater. And right now I live in the town of Manlius on Farley Lane. And I'm hoping I can help out um, wherever I can. George. Hi, uh, George Lorpus, uh, resident of town of Manlius on Whetstone Road. And I've seen my share of stormwater overflows and um, had some ideas and I hope I could contribute uh, uh, to the group. Okay, thank you very much. So our format is to let our speakers give a little, um, I think I need to make you co-host. Um, as long as we're able to share screen, I think you can make it so that all participants can share screen. So, so Aaron, I've put you in, um, which one of you wants to go first? Go for it, Aaron. All right, Aaron, you should be able to share your screen. And um, so we'll, we'll have our two presenters talk, then we'll have some dialogue with them and then dialogue amongst ourselves. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, just give me a second. Bear with me here, I'm bringing it up. All right, do you all see that? We do. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Aaron Buckdown with the Onondaga County Soil and Water Conservation District uh, Program Manager. And um, I try to keep this somewhat brief. Um, hopefully what I've, what I've found is gonna you know, hit what the audience is looking for. Uh, but I just wanna give you kind of an overview uh, we provide multiple services throughout the county. We work with um, farm operators to do agricultural best management practices to address fields runoff issues, you know, erosion, uh, managing uh, water on fields and stuff of that nature, drainage problems. We also do, um, we have a municipal hydro seeding program where we work with municipalities to, uh, basically we can cost share seeding areas that are disturbed. 
We're involved with the county stormwater program. We do the illicit discharge elimination program for the county where we look at uh, points of discharge from say road culverts and drainage structures. And uh, basically we inspect that and then we report back to the county um, if we see an issue or something of that nature needs to be investigated. We also do uh, the stormwater pollution prevention uh, program inspections for construction sites on county owned properties. So we will go out and um, check and make sure that things are being maintained properly on construction sites for the purpose of stormwater control. Uh, we have an invasive species management program. We also do tree risk assessment for the village of Liverpool. And uh, we'd be able to do that for other municipalities as well. And we do kind of an urban forestry component with ash tree and hemlock, woody adelgid, woody adelgid which is an invasive insect. We, we do management with that. Drainage uh, problems, site in investigations when property owners have an issue with drainage, uh, we'll go out, look at the site and give recommendations for that. And also evaluating problems with stream erosion and stream stabilization. And feel free to chime in if you have any questions. Um, I try to tailor this more for stormwater. So typically larger common plan developments uh, require a DC stormwater permit for areas over one acre. Uh, they need to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan that's required for those locations. And uh, they utilize the standards and specifications for erosion and sediment control which is a DEC sponsored document, so to speak, that has all of the centers and specs that need for, for what needs to be installed to address those sites. So I was thinking in, in terms of, you know, residents of the town of Manly, it's at large. Uh, there may be a lot of smaller sites, homeowners that have building lots that are under one acre in size. You're not required to install these practices, but you may benefit from those if you are considering doing some type of work on your property. And um, just kind of a note that if you know you had an activity that you're not required to be permitted to do that activity, if you cause a contravention of water quality, you can still run into issues with the DEC as far as regulations go. And <clears throat> So, sorry, these are, so these are examples of some different types of practices if you're not too familiar with them that uh, we might have out on larger construction projects that maybe a homeowner might be interested in doing if they're doing stuff on their, their property. Uh, so silt fence is one example. I'm sure many of you have seen this out there before. Uh, it helps to keep silt from leaving the site. Basically it catches sediment laden water which infiltrates into the ground and um, that sediment is captured and can be scraped away and used elsewhere. And just a note, I've taken a lot of these slides from our uh, DC endorsed four hour erosion and sediment control training that we use for contractors, uh, which they have to sit through this every three years, I believe it is. Um, so that's where these slides kind of came from. I borrowed it from there just to give them credit. But here's another example, uh, hydro seeding or basically seed establishment. So, you know, you get your bit, bit, um, a major benefit just from being able to put seed down on a site that's disturbed. Another practice that might be useful for um, a resident would be using filter socks around the property if they're doing a lot of grading work on their property, they could install filter socks, which will, again, you can see by the picture, catch the runoff and uh, catch that sediment before it leaves the site, allow that to filter out. Another thing I thought might be important is drop inlet protection, um, mainly because if you're doing work around areas that are previously developed, we want to try to keep runoff silt sediment from entering those catch basins, keeps it out of the receiving water bodies and also uh, is, is good for the sake of 
the municipality being able to maintain those structures since they have to clean them out every so many years. So if there's, you know, not a lot of debris in there, it's less maintenance for them. Green infrastructure practices is, is another thing that I was thinking about in terms of previously developed property. Um, being if you're doing some type of a revision project or, or redoing a site, being able to put in these types of practices such as a bioretention basin or a rain garden, uh, basically you're, you're catching all that stormwater that would normally go into the stormwater infrastructure, your, your pipes and culverts to outlet to a water body. And instead of putting it into that infrastructure, you're putting these practices in so that it can absorb into the ground, infiltrate, and so that reduces stress on the overall system. So here's an example of a rain garden. Um, I know a lot of areas, they, they will do these retroactively on sites when they're doing work. And it's pretty much putting in a sand bed with a gravel base, having a planting mix. You've got vegetation that likes to uh, be in a wet environment, kind of have its feet wet, so to speak. That allows that water to soak in instead of having it being dumped into a catch basin or some other type of a storm drain. Another example here, um, this is from the DEC slides, is a dry swale, basically the same concept. You have the parking lot runoff goes into a dry swale during a storm event that water can infiltrate instead of being kicked out into the existing stormwater infrastructure. And so the other thing I, I thought to touch on was operation and maintenance. Um, I think that's an important thing looking forward with a lot of municipalities as stuff has been installed in the past 10, 20 plus years of making sure that, you know, keep, keeping an eye on the lifespan for these different types of practices and going in there and cleaning them out as necessary. So a lot of times what we're dealing with on construction sites is temporary practices like silt fencing. Uh, the sediment should be removed once you've got about 50% capacity so that that can continue to serve its function. As far as permanent structures that are installed on, on properties, uh, a lot of times things like ponds, four bays, you know, water detention basins, they'll need periodic dredging and things like culvert rock outlet protection. Uh, one example of that is here where you can see, you know, when this was put in, obviously all this sediment and debris wasn't here. Over time that needs to be cleaned out and if it's not cleaned out that obviously presents a problem. So just keeping that in mind. And that was essentially what I had. Um, but here's my contact information. If you have any questions, there's the, you know, the, the standard specifications, the blue book, uh, the link for that, and also the stormwater design manual. And like I said, I kind of tried to approach this at looking at what we deal with on larger construction sites and condense this into 10 minutes. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, please feel free to ask me any, any questions or anything else that I could provide assistance with. Um, you know, walking into this, I, I wasn't quite sure some of what you guys are specifically looking at, but uh, again. Well, I, th I think you, I think you did it um, just right, Aaron. Are there any questions for Aaron about the you know soil and water concentration. One of the things that came up when we had our our program where we tried to come up with questions was was preventing sediment from running into the, the creeks and um, brooks. And I think you have addressed that. But does anybody have like a follow up question or anything? I do. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah so this is Don Gates. I don't know if my screen showing. I had trouble logging in. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron, um, this is Don. We've met before. I, I work with Project Watershed. Um, anyways, I have a question, you know, you showed the different practices to slow, and I came in a little bit late to try to retain water on site. Who keeps track of the amount of water going from one site, from one watershed to the next? And that leads to my second question is, if you're a downstream, 
watershed. So like I live in the Glencliff neighborhood, right? And upstream, it goes from village to town. And I'm just wondering, so if people are not doing good practices upstream, my neighborhood is affected downstream. So do, do one, do you keep track of rates of flow of water and whose responsibility is it? Because my understanding is the village of Malian has to pay quite a bit of money to maintain the dam and other areas in the Glencliff drainage basin. But if people or if neighborhoods above or if there are poor practices, let's say in the town of Manly, the town of Pape, the village of, well, the hamlet or whatever you want to call it, the neighborhood of Glencliff will be adversely affected. And not only that, it costs the village. Who's responsible for maintaining drainage areas, basically? And then who bears the cost? Yeah. Excuse me, Aaron, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. And that was a long question. I apologize for it. It was more succinct. Don, thanks for joining us. Don is a member of the Comprehensive Planning Steering Committee. And um, I also just want to ask uh, everyone to please mute themselves if they're not speaking. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say something. Sorry, so, Aaron, if you want, if you, you are the host right now, actually, too. So if you want to make me the host again, um, maybe I can help with the screen thing. Yes, um, let's see here. All right, sorry about this. I'm still somewhat fuzzy sometimes with Zoom. Um, I've got sharing options as only host. No, go back to all participants. All participants, okay. But then over in, in participants, find my name and make me the host. So light up on top of me more. Make host. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so Don, to uh, hopefully answer your question, um, you know, a New York State drainage law, essentially, you're not supposed to kick any water from your you're not supposed to divert any water that's not already going in that direction. So in the case of the, you know, additional water being contributed from people who live in the town of Pompey, you know, historically that water would have been going there and going down to your town anyway. I don't know if that somewhat answers your question. <laughs> Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I have to go pick up my son at something in a minute, but um, not really. Um, my understanding is that the village of Manlius has to pay money and upkeep on the dam in the village in the Glencliff neighborhood, backed by Three Falls Woods. But yet that property stretches into the town of Manlius and the watershed itself goes up to Pompeii. So yeah. why is the cost bared on... Fully, it's, why does the cost fall completely on the village of Manlius? Shouldn't that cost be distributed amongst the municipalities by, let's say, acreage or something? I think the question would be who owns the dam? And well, but it's okay, who owns the dam? I don't know. That's would go back to I don't know who owns the dam. Paul probably knows. Um, I'm not sure if we own the dam, we maintain the dam. So, so whoever owns it should be paying it then. Right. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because there's that's that's a bigger question that comes with all the streams that come down through our village. I know that, um, Aaron, you said that you do stream erosion and stabilization. To what extent do you do that? Because that's a huge issue right now. We Huge issue. That is also my question, Paul. Thank you for articulating that. I won't have to raise my hand now. <laughs> Um, because uh, the word is that the village is the village. The village. First, let me be clear: the village has been told that we're not to step a foot in the creek. It's not our responsibility. Yeah, of course, we take all the heat from the the neighbors that complain about the erosion and and everything that happens in the creek. And um, 
And then the, in the second breath, we hear from the DEC that if we do anything in, near or in the creek, we have to have a permit. And in all honesty, we don't want to do anything because of the expense incurred by what it would take. We're working closely with FEMA right now to try to get some funding to help whatever it takes to get satisfaction for these people. But again, as Don said, we don't have, we shouldn't be responsible for uh, less than a quarter mile of creek when there's 20 miles of creek that come down out of Derider through our, through our community that we have no control over. So we can dump hundreds of thousands of dollars into doing something for the creek, um, which we don't have, but it could still end up not solving the problem that's coming from up above. And I say that's the same with whatever comes out of Three Falls Woods and stuff. That comes from up and, up and beyond 173 and Sweet Road, yeah, we take the brunt of it down in, in, in the village on Glen Cliff and, and uh, down across 173 when it gets to the creek. So I, I nobody seems to want to take responsibility for it. And yet Could I? I, on your list, I saw where you do stream erosion and stabilization. And I guess I want to know to what extent and for who. I, yeah. Go ahead, Doc. I got one suggestion, well, not suggestion, but one way to look at it. And then I, uh, I'll be driving my car, I'll have to listen is, Aaron, do you guys track or who tracks the amount of water that lands in an area? So let's say you got a football field and that football field, an inch of rain falls, right? Yes. So if I'm the property owner and, and historically, before I developed that land, that inch of rain on that hundred yard football field stayed all on the hundred yard football field. But let's say I start putting up houses or I just build a big house with a big parking lot. Now that one inch of rain is going to run downhill somewhere to another neighborhood or a community. Should, should not the taxation or the maintenance costs be determined by acreage and um, percolation rate and how it's changed over time? So if I'm a developer and I develop houses above, let's say in the town of Pompeii, along the watershed, shouldn't I be bearing that cost of ensuring that historical amount of water stays on my property? Because otherwise it just runs right down the neighborhood here and impacting as Paul was saying, I, I'm, t you know, as village residents, people complain about taxes, Well, he can't do anything about it. If there's hundreds of gallons of water coming down more each year and we can anticipate more and more coming down. And also it, it affects the trout quality because um, it wipes out trees and um, so no matter if a homeowner takes the time to apply for a DEC permit, it's like trees for tribs, that's going to be completely ineffective. If there's a thousand or a hundred year storm event, it will now wipe out that recent planting. So right. I think there Don, needs let, to be a- Let's, say, let's I'm sorry. let Aaron yeah. answer the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I went on. I, I, I apologize. Thank you for interrupting. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. No, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, there, Don, there let me are... get a chance to go on mute, okay? Or Sarah, do you mind people? <laughs> There, there are, um, and I, I would have to look back into it, but there are considerations with uh, site development where you look at, you know, current land use and proposed land use, where you take into account uh, the installing more pervious air, impervious area and converting something from um, you know, say an agricultural field to a housing development, they do have to take into account addressing the increased runoff from those sites during construction. Um, now, post-construction, I, I, I believe that that's typically where you get um, involved with things like retention basins and ponds where, you know, you, you'll see some of these housing developments will have large basins put in place to collect stormwater and then slowly release that back out into the system. So that. So Aaron, I, I'm gonna ask you to talk about this stream stabilization. Um, and, and then I, I think Andy can probably address implementing the SWIP stuff a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. do you talk about the stream stuff a little bit because there's a couple questions about that. Yeah, so we've had um, just in the past year, uh, 
well, well over 20 concerns regarding stream erosion problems. Uh, we've had some significant storm events, and in some cases, a 100 year storm event in different areas of the county. And of course, people call us. So we, we've, at this point, we've been going out to evaluate those sites. We've typically provided technical assistance in saying, well, you know, um, yes, obviously you have a problem here and we can help you navigate the permitting process to put a project on the ground. Uh, we're, there are state grants available to do stream bank stabilization projects. We haven't done one in several years, often, oftentimes because there is a cost share component to the landowner involved. So one of the, uh, oftentimes one of the issues becomes we have a, a homeowner who has a stream problem. And we look at the site and we say, yes, you obviously have a problem. We can help you with the permitting and putting stuff together. And what it turns into, you're going to have to pay $20,000 out of pocket or whatever it is in spite of applying for grant funding, at that point, it tends to fall apart. Uh, we've also worked with, um, or we did a, I should say we did a project a number of years ago where we evaluated in the towns of Cicero and possibly part of it mainly is as well, looking at uh, debris jams, log debris jams in Butternut Creek, West Branch Limestone, and Limestone Creek. Um, we kind of went through, evaluated those sites and looked at them and put points on a map and said at some point we could possibly do something if there was funding available. Um, I am sorry about my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, there's, there's definitely opportunities available. Like I said, a lot of what we have been doing is more assessment and evaluation work um, and, and seeing where we could take it from there. There has been uh, Madison County, I know they had contracted with, I believe it was a town of Cicero to do some of that log jam removal. Whereas basically they, they come up with a cost, this is how much it'll be. And the town is able to contribute a certain amount of money. I, I don't know if they had yes, to pay we did We did do that. It was a, we shared with Sullivan and, and yes. we did a thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I wanna, so. I wanna move on a little bit because I wanna make sure Lauren has time. But Andy, did you wanna say anything about the SWIP before we move on to Lauren? Well, I'll just say, when I think about SWIP, it's obviously for the period of time when a um, project site is underway. So those are the, the prevention measures uh, for the purposes of keeping stormwater flow that's, uh, I guess, the temporary implications during a construction sequence. I'm sorry, Aaron has a dog and I have four kids here. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I uh, that's perhaps different than the question that Don was asking about in the course of a development project, why, why are we not, uh, you know, post construction, why are the measures that should be taken in the engineering process for a new development, not resulting in the right implications for that watershed. And when you make a new development, don't you put in stormwater um, facilities so that it stays there? Yes, if the engineering is correct and proper and accurate, then yes, you should be putting the engineering measures in place to control both stormwater quantity and stormwater quality. Um, I think the problem that we're all seeing recently, nationwide, planet-wide, is all of a sudden these 100-year storms seem to be happen happening every 18 months. That doesn't seem to add up. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's just this region that's experiencing it. We can see that it's throughout the Northeast and whatnot, but we've certainly seen our share of them lately. And we all know the problem areas, even within central New York and the Mohawk Valley that are most affected. So um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer other than to say that if the engineering is correct, it should be adequate, but clearly we're seeing areas where it's inadequate. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Um, I wanna move on to Lauren, but if other people have questions, we may circle back 
to Erin, but I want to make sure Lauren has time. So um, Lauren, can you share your screen? Uh, yeah, you should be able to see it right now. Okay, Let's get into thank you. Uh, and I will apologize. I'm getting some notices that my internet is kind of slow. So uh, hopefully that doesn't cause a problem, but it is kind of, oh, here we go with the with the presentation. So um, before I get started, just a few comments on the conversation that was just happening. Um, so the EPA does have a good tool um, that's a stormwater generation calculator. So you plug in specifics about the amount of impervious surface or land being disturbed, and it'll help um, you understand uh, what sort of you know stormwater volume you could expect from those changes. Um, I'll also say that you know when you're considering. Um, you know, what sort of stormwater disturbance or changes will come from new development site plan review is a really great opportunity to be looking at those questions and trying to find solutions to those potential problems. Of course, that relies on, you know, the site plan review within your own town, right, because you aren't uh, quite successful in crossing borders that way. So I don't know why um, this isn't loading. Um, but I'll just give it another second to kick on or I'll, you know, just go without the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so while I'm <laughs> waiting for that to hopefully load, my name is Lauren Darcy. I'm an environmental planner with the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. Uh, we are a regional development council serving the five county region, um, Onondaga, uh, Madison, uh, Cayuga, Cortland, and Oswego. Uh, and so one of our roles is to staff the Central New York Stormwater Coalition, which is a 29 um, municipality membership organization that exists to uh, you know, address stormwater problem and, and particularly help in meet help each municipality in meeting their permit requirements under um, the New York State DC general permits for municipal separate storm sewer systems. Um, so that, you know, acronym is MS4. Um, and uh, really don't think this is going to get loaded. So I'm just going to keep going. And I apologize because um, I do have some pretty good graphics in there. So, Lauren, just to let you know, we have a website where this will be loaded. So you can send us the PowerPoint and we can have it there. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, a municipal separate storm system is kind of what it sounds like in the name. It is a system of storm um, drains and other types of infrastructure that are designed to convey stormwater from wherever it lands um, in town to a stream or a water body. So a separate storm sewer is different from a uh, sewage sewer, wastewater sewer, or a combined sewer in that it is not transport. Oh, here we go. Perfect. I'm just going to stay on this so we don't have a problem. But um, so uh, a municipal separate uh, storm sewer, as you can see in this diagram, uh, water is collected directly from the street or land and goes into a stream or lake. There is no you know, treatment or interception point where the water is uh, taken before it goes you know, into our lake or stream ecosystems. And so as a result of that, there is an opportunity for anything that's on land to make its way with that stormwater into the lakes, streams, rivers, any kind of surface water bodies. So things like pesticides that are on lawns, fertilizers that are put on lawns and the associated nutrients with that. Road salt is a big um, thing to be thinking about this time of year. Uh, plastic litter, food wrappers, things on the street, pet waste, uh, if not cleaned up, household chemicals, things associated with cars. Basically, if it hits you know, the street, if it hits your yard, it can be carried in stormwater to a direct uh, surface water body, um, which is problematic, right? Because, you know, the surface water bodies are a source of our drinking water. They're a, you know, big source of recreation and they're an important, you know, habitat overall for the, the stability and functioning of our world. Um, so the stormwater coalition I mentioned exists to help municipalities in meeting conditions of the general permit. So stormwater, and stormwater pollution is regulated under the Clean Water Act. It's part of the phase two stormwater rule. Uh, and the DEC is responsible, is responsible for implementing stormwater management programs in New York State. And so they handle this by issuing uh, general permits uh, that every MS4 municipal storm, separate storm sewer community uh, must meet. Um, the permit you know, details um, 
creating a stormwater management program, naming stormwater program uh, management officials within the MS4 community. Uh, and there's a decent amount of reporting associated with that as well. So there are best practices and actions that have to be implemented across six areas, which are called minimum control measures. So there's public education uh, best practices, there's public participation and involvement best practices, illicit discharge and detection, um, construction site runoff control, post-construction site runoff control, and municipal actions, pollution prevention, and good housekeeping. So we talked a little bit about construction site runoff control with Aaron. Uh, he mentioned illicit discharge and detection. Basically, that means anything that's not rain that makes its way into the sewer system, that's an illicit discharge. It's not allowed under the permit. Um, so I have public education outreach in bold here because that's the main purpose that the stormwater Co coalition serves. We um, maintain uh, and execute a public education and outreach program about stormwater uh, to a variety of audiences, including your municipal officials, the general public, contractors, developers, et cetera. Um, we also do uh, provide some assistance with meeting requirements of um, mapping and putting on municipal training series to help meet requirements in that area too. Uh, <clears throat> And so some of our education outreach activities include our website, uh, newsletters, various fact sheets. Uh, when this was a thing, we would table and you know, participate in community events to get the word out, um, just a sampling of our activities. But uh, you know, I'll just take this opportunity to say that a good chunk of our land use is you know, private residential area and every curb is a shoreline uh, anywhere leads to our waterways through stormwater. So there are a lot of um, things to consider on you know, personal property and in yards that are really important for uh, maintaining a high water quality. Uh, and I've focused a lot on water quality so far in my presentation, but there are also practices on you know, properties that help mitigate uh, high volumes of water too, which is what is problematic for erosion sedimentation. Um, so, you know, we talked about green infrastructure before with Aaron. Uh, rain gardens are really useful for slowing water flows, but they are also very important um, opportunities for any pollutants or sediments or, you know, other things that we don't want in our surface waters to be filtered out. Um, so that kind of, you know, hits the, hits both, you um, needs to slow volumes and flows and to remove contaminants from it in the first place. Um, so this graphic is from our friends in Monroe County, um, kind of points out different areas on your yard and things that you can do, uh, avoiding pesticides, using no phosphorus fertilizers, etc. cetera. Um, so that is the gist of what I have here. I'm happy to answer questions on anything I did talk about, elaborate on things that I didn't quite get to. Uh, and that's my contact information. Thank you. Any questions for Lauren? I have one again. Yeah. Can you, can you explain a little bit or give an example of an illicit discharge? I, I heard you say yeah. that, but I wasn't sure if I caught it correctly. Absolutely. So there are kind of a couple types of illicit discharges. Uh, an obvious example would be you know, someone going to a storm drain with their leftover pesticide and, you know, dumping it down the drain because they need to get rid of it. Uh, that would be an illicit discharge, a pretty obvious example. Uh, a less obvious example would be often there are um, kind of cross, you can find cross connections between the sewer system, like the wastewater sewer system mm -hmm. and uh, the storm sewer system that aren't supposed to be there, but you know, somewhere along the line, they got cross connected. Uh, that is another source of illicit discharges. And that would be, you know, sewage getting into the, to the storm system. Um, and then sometimes groundwater seepage can be, you know, an illicit discharge if a pipe is broken um, and, you know, groundwater can kind of seep into that. So um, indirect and direct. Uh, Here's one that I have observed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I walk the neighborhoods, you know, I just walk around and look. And so if a resident has their gutter and they have the drain of the gutter, going to another property or directly into a creek, that would be an illicit discharge, correct? Because now you got that whole roof 
mm-hmm. instead of it draining in percolating into their yard because they don't want to maintain their backyard and it's just a swamp and they don't want to grade it properly. Mm-hmm. Instead, they're just pushing it right down to the creek, straight off the roof. Would that be an illicit discharge or is that just their prerogative? It's my land. I get to do what I want. That is, I don't think you could call that an illicit discharge, but that is not a best practice by any stretch, right? So if that is directed to pavement, it just, like you said, pools and goes somewhere else without any sort of- No, this, is directed, this goes directly into a stream with trout. Okay, right that's you. I mean, again, it's a bad practice. Uh, it's not necessarily like okay. strictly illegal under an illicit discharge, um, but it's, it's a bad practice. So I'm I'm gonna, follow. I'm gonna ask, um, Lauren, could you talk a little bit more about roof drains? Because we've actually had a couple of people come to the town specifically mm-hmm. about what roof drain. Yeah, so I um, some interventions related to gutters and roof drains that are considered a best practice are um, disconnecting downspouts and um, you know sending them into gardened areas, um, not directly into stream, not directly into a storm drain, but into yeah. a garden or somewhere where there's some design uh, oriented towards percolation. And another best practice is to use rain barrels, um, collect the rain when it's, you know, high flow and use it during a drier time. So, you know, we talked a little bit about climate change before someone brought it up. And one of the climate signals for this region of, you know, kind of our unique place in the Northeast and the Great Lakes is um, increased precipitation volume at a specific amount of time. So we are experiencing, you know, generally a little more rain than we have in the past, but what's more like, erratic about it is that we're getting higher volumes at one moment in time. And so using rain barrels is a really great way to take some of that rain that we're getting at one moment in time to be able to use during a more drought period, which is something we're experiencing, um, periods of heavy rain followed by periods of drought. So um, there have been some very successful um, municipal sponsored rain barrel programs that I've seen in other places. So that's certainly something to consider, but you know, rain barrels are widely available in hardware stores. There's some really great DIY opportunities. And at the end of the day, like they're such a smart choice for someone to adopt because you're saving water uh, that you would be, you know, paying for by running the hose, but also plants uh, don't like hose water as much as they like rainwater because the rainwater doesn't have any of the you know components added during uh, filtration or piping that hose water does. Thank you, George. Has a question. Yes. Um, uh, do you address um, stor- uh, storm water runoff from farms? I know I was going to ask that of uh, Aaron. Also, mm-hmm. you mentioned a lot of it was residential. What about farmland? Yeah. So the stormwater coalition's focus is much more of that suburban urban land use, because that is the, those are the municipalities that have the requirements associated with the MS4. So I think Aaron could probably speak more to the agricultural uh, runoff. Yeah. So um, we have, we have two different programs essentially that we work with. One of them is, is a voluntary incentivized program called agricultural environmental management and that's where we are actively working with farms uh, to address issues with field erosion field runoff and things of that nature Uh, and we we do different types of projects where we try to address that that water and the other one is the DEC has the CAFO requirements that the farms are required to follow so uh, essentially, as, as opposed to being voluntary for many of the smaller farms, larger farms have to implement certain practices in order to be compliant with the CAFO permit. So, and, and we work with them on that as well and, and setting out and doing different types of projects. So it's, um, I guess the best answer would be, it, it depends, but we are out there in the landscape working with people as, as far as trying to address that field runoff. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Mary and William and Gary, if you have any questions for the, the panelists. Uh, none from me at this time. Erin, I have a question about what, what is the latest edition of the stormwater management uh, 
Um, I'm not sure what, who are you asking that question of this. The uh, MS4 plan is so 2019. Uh, is I mentioned one. the um, stormwater management um, manual. I have worked from that, but I wanted to know what is the latest edition of the stormwater manual, stormwater control manual. So I think that was on your slide, Erin. Do you know when that was done? Yeah, so the what what they would call the blue book that the most recent rendition of that was in 2016. That's the okay. standards and specifications for erosion and sediment control on construction sites. And um, there's a design manual that was released in 2015 that is, is largely green infrastructure practices. Might be what you're thinking about. Well, I, I was using it in the 2000s. So that, and I'm familiar with it because we used it quite a bit when I worked at in maintenance in DOT in Region 9 out of Binghamton. So I, I did not work in this area, but we did use that um, manual quite, quite often, but I, it was an earlier edition. And that was my question. Yeah, and my, my last slide, um, I think you, you said that was gonna be put on the- yeah, It'll be on the website, thank you. It'll be on the website. My last slide had um, both of those, the blue book and also the design ah, manual. Yeah. So if you want to access that, you know, you can download that from the DEC's website. Sure. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. I had a couple of things. I just wanted to interject that um, when Aaron was talking about um, site construction, sort of the management of potential erosion um, or sediment that was, that's leaving and water that's leaving a site, um, and that there's a plan put in place and it's monitored. We have, as a community, a stormwater districts um, that, you know, allow us to draw lines and include the folks who would be part of that, that site. And um, we invest in, in maintenance and, and, and upkeep and dealing with, with incidents. Um, so I'm thinking now of the um, the drainage district um, and the stormwater district behind, or I should say the drainage district behind me where I live and how we have a retention basin that um, is at the end of a, a street that will likely be uh, in, enlar enlarged. And we had, we had a general sense as a lay, lay people that you know something like a rain garden might be a good opportunity. And so what I understand is that a municipality and Rob knows this really well, we our planning department um, works with the contracted team and with the with the planning board to sort of develop a um, a plan of action there, and we're using the best practices I hope at that point. But how our community decides to have to articulate best practices for our district too is that, that part of the MS four? Are we really just using the MS four guidelines? Or are we supposed to be using the comprehensive plan guidelines? I guess I just want to understand what, as a municipality, what, what would be recommended? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there's kind of an answer that gets to all of the above, right? Because at the end of the day, then it's for permit is a set of minimum measures you have to meet. Um, and uh, there are a lot of minimum measures to be met. Don't get me wrong, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there can't be uh, a desire to do something beyond that. And I, that's a great, that's a great role for a comprehensive plan to be, to, to serve, right? Like this is, you know, our aspiration or this is what we want to see in our community. Um, so I think it is a, you know, it is a best practice for stormwater to be figured into comprehensive planning and kind of a holistic thinking about your land use, right? Because stormwater is really generated by land use. So if you're not thinking about it in the general comprehensive planning, you're missing an opportunity. Which is why I was so happy to hear that, you know, there's a whole session devoted to stormwater as part of your <laughs> comprehensive planning. Yeah. I have one more question related to that then. You know, I'm hearing on the news today, the report about how 2050 will yield probably a foot rise in sea level for the East Coast. And as a community, how do we, what particularly happens um, 
in a state policy way to sort of have that information today really truly be represented in our in our policy and how far away are we from understanding that in the current state policy i i think our county doesn't have a, a, an agreed upon sort of yeah. um, sustainability plan yet but mm -hmm. certainly have the state guidelines and we certainly have you know the the soil and conservation we have all these resources that we're talking about so where do we if we're making a plan now what, what do we do to make sure that we're sort of making it as robust as we need it to, to be, knowing that policy doesn't say, mm -hmm. doesn't talk about that 2050 reality? Yeah. So, you know, as everybody here knows, New York is a home rule state. So land use decisions are local. Um, New York state does have a, it's department of state, I believe has a very good, uh, you know, guide for municipal um, laws for resilience. I forget the exact naming of it, but I'll send it after. Um, some municipal laws for climate resilience or something to that effect. And there are some really great model laws oriented towards um, flood prevention, oriented towards wetland restoration, oriented towards all these sorts of things that help manage um, higher water um, levels or higher precipitation levels that we can expect. So I think building those considerations um, and looking to science that you know shows what some of the projections for what the climate will be or the experiences we expect to have instead of the experiences we have had uh, are the, the two ways to accomplish that. Thank you so much. Thank you. William, I think you had something. Uh, not exactly a question pertaining so much as just a statement. I'd love to get some, some feedback from our experts on. Um, we're planning for the future right here, right now, but we're looking at in the next 48 hours, a predicted heavy melt and combined with heavy rain. We've discussed uh, the importance of our streamways and sediment erosion and the impacts that it's had on our residents. And it's going to have that same impact this week. So I guess I would just love to hear some of what our experts are aware of and are working on currently. Um, to address these concerns? It's a good question. It's not the first time in the past couple of days I've heard a concern about the high water levels because we've already been having, you know, high water levels even before this, you know, prediction of, of flooding. Um, I guess to me, this isn't a helpful answer because nothing that I can think to address it is really something that is like an immediate while there is, you know, water coming pending sort of answer. But to me, it just speaks to the need to really think about um, riparian areas and vegetated buffered areas and really um, giving the streams and water courses the space that they kind of need because water is going to go where it's going to go. Um, and there is, you know, some, to some extent we can, you know, help manage those flows, but for the most part, we need to give it some space to take the course that it is going to take. Um, and so that's where some of those resilience measures for like protecting wetlands or uh, reconstructing wetlands or protecting floodplains or restoring floodplains become very important because um, we're going to get more water. I know that's not really an answer to your question and I apologize. <laughs> that's the best that I have. Well, if I can if I can at least kind of maybe give you a little bit of broad idea of what we do. It's obviously we're, we're proactive and I'm sure Paul's guys are doing the same thing. Um, we're going to go out and we know areas that we've typically had problems within our community before with these types of situations. Uh, I know Gary, you know, he's got a pipe that goes down underneath the, the, the dead end of his facility. We've already gone up there, opened those pipes up for snow debris and ice debris that's in front of them. So not only his, but we've probably done about 30 or 40 of them in the last two days. Uh, certain areas we know where we have issues and over the next couple of coming days when the temperatures start coming up, you know, all your municipalities will be out doing the same thing. They're gonna be clearing off those catch basins, trying to give the best runoff we can. Uh, unfortunately, you got some areas and not necessarily in Manlands where we have a lot of issues with these uh, types of situations, but you know, you get out towards the Mohawk Valley in that area where they have a lot of their streams and creeks, they're constantly froze. Limestone Creek very seldom freezes because of the amount of flow that goes through. Um, but it has, and it does have sections that do, but you'll have some other areas where all of a sudden you get that high volume of water and ice just comes up and either jams in between bridges or purrs in the stream and those types of things. So 
you try to be as post uh, uh, pre proactive as you can before the event takes place, but you can only do so much. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of the general idea of what most municipalities are doing at this time. And I think, you know, from the planning and zoning point of view is giving the streams the space they need and not letting buildings be too close to them. Sarah, if I could just make one other comment, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of was going to bounce off of Andy's, you know, knowledge and, and experience of what's going on with with a new building and or the old mm -hmm. old building. The codes were different at the times when the DEC had different, um, we'll call it restrictions at the time, or different uh, areas of, of of what you had to do with your stormwater at that time that met the needs of what the areas were. So. One of the challenges I think that we have in Manlius, not only just us, but a lot of other municipalities, I know Paul has it, where we're working with something that was done 30, 40 years ago. Um, and we are very limited on space to do and have more runoff and, and, and have those uh, types of uh, things that we can use. Rain barrels are a great idea. I, I like the idea. I know Lauren brought those up. Um, but with some of our runoffs, you know, for our subdivisions that were built, they were built for the specifications of the DEC at the time. And obviously they've changed over the years. So, because we had to, and I think now is a good time to start thinking about, are we doing enough, you know what I mean, into the future? I was thinking the same thing with the comment about, um, you know, rip, rain gutters and, and stuff like that tied into the stormwater system. I believe that a lot of that's, you know, if it was built 30 or 40 years ago, you may have been grandfathered in being able to take your roof water and dump that into the storm drain, whereas new construction, you're not able to do that. And I, I definitely see that as a problem, you know, and how, how do you address that? George? I think uh, you guys touched on it. Uh, Rob did, and in, in reference by Andy to um, you know the increased rainfall, um, and I think I'm in agreement in looking at what we need to do and maybe rec rec make recommendations to re-engineer what has already been engineered as far as in the past, size of retention basins. Um, and, and other measures that we have to go back in time and look at what was done before. And we're gonna need to, I think, modify, um, you know, look forward uh, to new construction, that kind of thing. But we, we're gonna have to look back and see what has been done in the past. Is it adequate? If it isn't, what do we have to do to mitigate it? And I think um, we've been kind of touching on that and it's, it's been mentioned, but I don't know if that's part of our, our uh, uh, goal within this group. Um, I would think it would be at least to make the recommendations and get the engineers involved and see what can be done to uh, make up for old rules, old codes. As, as an aside to that, George, um, you know, from our end, a lot of the stuff that we design is sized to a 10 year, 24 hour storm event, sometimes a 25 year storm event uh, over 24 hours. And the, the, some of the issues that we've seen personally is, is designed to handle that amount of water. But if you get that amount of water instead of a 24 hour period, if that amount of water falls in a 12 hour period, the system is overwhelmed and you know we're uh, again we're, we're trying to design this to the specs that we're following but to try to take into consideration that you might get a couple of inches of water at least what we've seen a few inches of water within a couple of hours as opposed to that 24-hour period mm -hmm. and how that system gets overwhelmed because it was sized for a 24-hour period of time it might be something taken into consideration. Heather? 
So we have, you know, our critical response committee, and I'm not familiar with its entire remit. I mean, maybe Mayor Roll can talk about this, but um, emergencies are emergencies, right? So this, you know, certainly, certainly, a, you know, flash flooding um, causes huge problems. So I think it's interesting to think of it in a security sort of um, perspective. But I also wonder if it makes sense for us as a comprehensive plan group to think about creating the same way we're looking at our zoning and areas where we know for economic development, you know, we want to think about maybe some corridors or understand farmland and sort of work to preserve areas. I wonder if we could work with the villages, Mayor Rural, we should talk with um, you know, Mayor Olson and also Mayor Brazil about this too, but for, for since we're interdependent on the, on, on the water side of things, and we could also visit our neighbor, we could talk to our neighbors about this too, highlighting areas for mutual um, grant applications um, um, for, for, you know, future work, sort of preventive work or, or um, mitigation work. But basically saying, hey, these are the areas that are going to be our, our joint priority areas for joint grants um, for, bi for big work that we know impacts each other. Um, I think that could be I, making a goal of the plan to, to identify those and come up with some sort of map or guide, you know, because we, we want something that will last beyond me sitting in this seat, even if it's 10 years for someone to be able to pick it up and, and understand the story of the, the conversation and the data, dig in and say, okay. Um, what, do, what do people think about that? Well, I think we, uh, I mean, it's probably a good idea that uh, we try to work together to try to get some of this stuff mitigated because I know that um, when I was a fire chief, a lot of our, our problems with flooding um, came from, believe it or not, this was for some of you even thought about being on the town board and stuff. It, it came from developments that were built um, surrounding on higher levels than the village and surrounding the, the village neighborhoods. And I'll use uh, the Glen Eagle on that development. That water in a, in a, in a major rainfall or a, uh, you know, a, a spring melting, that water would come down so fast and down through the uh, Academy Hill section that we we really couldn't do anything to help those people. I just hope that you know went on. The problem is that not only it would go from the town to the village and back into the town because it end up down in the development down where the old military academy was. Mm -hmm. Then they go across the road down towards where George lives and that that area until it found its way to the creek and it did a lot of damage and and. Back in the day, there was not any communication between, and again, this was way before your time, so mm -hmm. I hope this stuff clears up, but there was not really any communication between the town and the village of when they were putting in developments to say, how is this going to affect you? And we sit low, and the developments up above um, were, were flooding out everybody, even, even in the Poppy area. Poppy Pines and stuff, when they were doing that, that water came across Broadfield Road, came right down Whetstone Road and just flooded out everybody. And so that's one of the issues. And again, the other, go back to the other issue of the erosion and stabilization. Um, we're doing what, whatever we can to try to not necessarily put ourselves in the middle of something that we can't afford to do or, or that could really affect us for a long time. And um, we're, we're trying to get, find out who's responsible for what so that we know who to go to to try to get some of this stuff taken care of. Uh, I have a meeting Thursday with FEMA again. This is like the third or fourth one. And it all comes down to, well, who's, Who's in charge and who isn't in charge? And the thing is, I think the people, the higher level, whether it's the DEC, whether it's the county, whether it's FEMA, they should know who's in charge. They should know who's in charge of these creeks and who's responsible. Not say, well, we want to see your paperwork to see, you know, are you responsible or we're not responsible? We're not responsible for your creeks. But 
we need to do whatever we can to help our people because they're getting affected and they're looking for us for guidance. And it's very hard to get guidance. And But Aaron will be getting a phone call from me because he had to speak up on stream erosion stabilization. <laughs> so he will be hearing from me. Because right, that's thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And, and actually, we're going to continue this. Our next session, we'll, we'll probably have some people with um, more knowledge. Uh, this session was more on what land use. And the next session is going to be a little bit more on creeks and streams. So um, we hope to be able to perhaps be a little bit more um, of answers on, on that topic. George, is your hand up on purpose or is that just the Zoom thing? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I, we've, we've exhausted our time. I don't want to keep our guests longer than what they wanted to, but I do want to give everybody a chance for a little um, closing remark or other question if anybody has anything that they want to do as a wrap up. Well, I, I still ha ha have a question uh, because I would like to know where are the resources where we can have maps, uh, to topo maps, water flow maps, uh, so that we can take a look at past um, situations. And I think that would help us to design what needs to be done in the future. So I, is that at the Soil and Water District or who, where do you go to get this information? I have, some, I have some, Mary, that if you want to stop into my office, I have some that shows the, um, the flood, flood plain flood and plains? the flooding, where the water runs off in the Glencliff area, the, the um, Brickyard Falls area, it's in the west end of, of the village. I have that, that I got when we met with the floodplain people. So, but, but where do these maps reside? Is, uh, uh, there's a, is there a central place? The Onondaga County Planning Board has the GIS okay. clickable maps and they can, run specific maps if we if we're like doing doing a grant proposal or whatever they can run something specifically for us lauren do, does the does the central new york planning board also manage gis maps yeah so the central new york regional planning board for the stormwater coalition has been working on mapping the stormwater infrastructure so like catch basins um conveyance pipes etc and that should be on our website but sometimes it's hard to find so i can send a direct link to that location i think the town of manlius is pretty well mapped um, to the extent uh, that we've, you know, done some of the reconnaissance at this point, um, but I don't recall that for a fact. Okay, Lauren, if you could do send a link, that would mm -hmm. be terrific for our website, and I'll send a link to the. I'll ask the county to do the same thing for their, like they have the wetlands map where you just click the button and it tells you where the wetlands are, that kind of thing. Right, right. Sarah, mm -hmm. um, do these? Does anyone know? Do these maps have water flow rates on them, um, or any type? No. Well, okay, that's what I thought. They have flow rates for streams if mm -hmm. they have a, a monitor in them. USGS. USGS. Yes, yes. my, my problem stream doesn't have any monitoring. Yes. I'm the monitor for my problem stream, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that the FEMA um, flood mapping um, effort has has the streams, has profiles of the stream beds and has flow rates. Um, and uh, I forget all of the particular names for these documents now, but the only problem is, I'm not sure how much use there would be because the stream that runs past my house, I believe the last time the flow rate was done was 1972. Um, and there's been a tremendous amount of development since then. Um, but they do have stream bed profiles in great detail and, and flow rates in the, the FEMA flood. Um, I, offhand, I can't think of the exact description, but it's the FEMA floodplain maps for flood rate insurance maps. Ah. And there's a, there's a study uh, that was done um, for of the streams in the area. And I believe this is all in the town offices also available. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Other remarks or closing thoughts? I'll just say one thing. Can mm -hmm. I just say one? I just want to thank the guests. Um, this was very informative and to everybody who put this together. Um, I think it's great that Town of Manlius is going this way and as well as the village talking. I would suggest anybody that's interested in this issue, I do think 
we should highlight what citizens groups do. Um, I'm part of Isaac Walton League Project Watershed. We have over 20 years of data on streams through volunteers. So it's not always consistent. And anybody wants to monitor a stream in their neighborhood, we could give you the tools to monitor flow rate and all those different parameters. So if you have a stream right next to you, you could learn how to do this and get your flow rate and keep um, a historical average and, and then compare it over time. Because you really want data. If you're going to argue a point, I think you need to demonstrate it. So that's all I was going to say. That's great. Thank you. The Isaac Thank Walton you. League is a great resource in our community. Absolutely. Heather, you want to say something to wrap us up? Well, I just want to thank these members of the study group and comprehensive plan committee and our guests, our experts. Um, this is, you know, literally getting into the weeds or into the <laughs> as it is. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's with this effort, which is, you know, arduous because it's in the evening and everybody has busy lives, but your commitment to this will actually make a difference um, in the quality of our planning and in the efficiency of our budgeting. And, um, and I hope the quality of life for folks. So thank you so very much for being involved. And Sarah, thank you for everything you do to make this work. Um, Sarah is just just so such a fantastic project manager and I feel grateful for her partnership. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see you again. Um, Sarah, when's our when's our next time together? Oh, good question. What is this middle Tuesday and it would be the 15th. Hey, because February and March are always the same. So March 15th yeah, uh, will be March. our next germ water meeting. And uh, we will send you an invitation. We'll put some publicity on Facebook when, once we get our speakers lined up. So thank you very much to Lauren and Aaron and to everybody who participated this evening. Yeah. So much. I think we should take also into account the idea that the visuals and the mapping was really in, was of interest to folks. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can um, take that as a cue yep. to think about um, um, our next conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.